the expansion of our industry, the business of the industry, and other things. So that's where we're going today. Uh, it's an experiment, and we appreciate you being part of it. Uh, we really appreciate our supporting organizations, and they are, you can see them there, the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg, the, the Trade and Investment Office here in New York. We really appreciate their support. Uh, Kratos uh, Defense is a sponsor and a supporter of ours. We appreciate that. New Space New York City is uh, a supporting organization, and uh, you heard from them uh, two sessions ago. Rice Space Institute in Houston, Texas, and Dr. David Alexander uh, have been supporting us. World Teleport Association is uh, one of our supporting organizations. And of course, the Washington Space Business Roundtable, our sister roundtable uh, down in that city where they play politics and not have real conversations as much as we have them. So, but we do thank the Washington Space Business Roundtable for being part of this. And especially uh, our friends at Space News. Uh, we have the significant digit segment coming up and um, it is something that we really uh, really have been told is something people are looking forward to so you'll hear from uh, two of their uh, writers in a few moments but as i said today is uh, july 20 oh i also want to thank the members of sspi without them none of this takes place for us and the new york space alliance uh, our partner in this endeavor uh, today is July 20th, 53 years ago today, the United States of America kept a promise its young president had made to the entire world earlier in that decade. From nearly every angle of human activity and human culture, it was celebrated as a collective leap of imagination. We had kept that imagination or that element of exploration in the recesses of our subconscious minds and in our fictional narratives. We have three authors with us today, by the way. It always seemed real to those who knew it had to be. Many of us are on this panel today and are in the industry. In the end, of course, it was nuts and bolts, engineers. Many of them, I'm proud to say, right here in Long Island, New York, where, where I'm coming from today, uh, who made this thing happen. They put ink to paper and wrote the poetry that has us peering from the darkness of the human corridors at the wonder uh, that's around us. What an effect it has had. Uh, so before we get going, SSPI is pleased to present this video from our Better Satellite World campaign collection to get us started today. So Matt, if you wouldn't mind rolling it. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. The 1960s ushered in an era of human space exploration that has never been equaled. Humans traveled farther from our planet than ever before, not once, but half a dozen times. And those journeys sparked the dreams and ambitions of millions. And then we stopped. We flew robots to other planets, we put satellites and space stations into orbit. But people never again answered the call to leave our planet far behind in a quest for knowledge and opportunity to open new horizons for others to follow. Never until now. NASA's Artemis program is committed to landing American astronauts on the moon again, to explore, to make discoveries, and lay the foundation for a permanent and productive human presence. This new NASA mission will search for water to turn into oxygen and fuel, and for materials to build landing pads, housing, and workspace. NASA is designing a new spaceship called Orion to carry astronauts from Earth to lunar orbit, where a lander will deliver them to the moon. Orion will climb into space on a massive new rocket called the Space Launch System. Those few minutes of rocket flight are among the riskiest in the journey. The Space Launch System will battle gravity by burning nearly a million gallons of fuel at enormous temperature and pressure. The rocket must balance on that pillar of fire and settle into the right orbit 
with the precision of a star athlete scoring a goal. Helping to make that possible is Periton's software product, OS Comet. The men and women of Periton developed and deployed it decades ago to monitor and control space vehicles and rocket launches. Improving and expanding year by year, OS Comet is now one of the key platforms on the Artemis program, used to monitor and control the Orion spacecraft and the liftoff of the Space Launch System. OS Comet is one small part of a great adventure. Humanity's return to the moon keeps the promises made more than half a century ago. It also represents the first steps toward the next giant leap from the moon to Mars. Returning to the moon, we begin to seize a greater destiny. To become a people who sail the vast darkness and silence of space as readily as we do the seas and skies of Earth. To ensure humanity's future, regardless of how our home planet changes. That future begins now. Space and satellite. The world's invisible, indispensable technologies. Brought to you by the Space and Satellite Professionals International with the support of Periton. Well, again, uh, thanks to SSPI and, and especially Periton for putting up the bucks to do that. But um, this is kind of, it's kind of a reminder um, of what today is all about and, and where we're going. But as I said earlier, this is gonna be um, sort of the next level of discussion approach because we're gonna be talking about the human experience uh, in a way that uh, is not about nuts and bolts necessarily or, or the technical. We're gonna be looking for the balance as we begin to go out and to do uh, things and what is going to happen to us in our human psychology and psyche and our own narrative as this goes forward. So we'll, we'll be touching on many of those things today. And so this month's big question is how can we stay on the middle path through both our successes and our challenges while continuing to build towards the future. And uh, as my colleague Joe Fargnoli always points out, um, we can't keep having these lurches where we go someplace and do this great technical uh, achievement and then stop. Uh, we have to find a balance to get ourselves uh, to build this uh, stairway uh, to, our to our destiny. So again, we'll be looking at that, but we'll also be looking at how, again, internally, we uh, shape a balance for ourselves to handle some of the traumas that are going to be involved. And uh, Lon Levin has uh, spoken very articulately about that, and we're sure he's going to do it again today. Okay, but let's, let's go right back to Earth, where two journalists do terrific work in areas that are of significant importance to us, uh, such as inflation and economic headwinds that we're looking at uh, throughout the economy. So uh, what I'd like to do today is to uh, welcome back Jason Rainbow, the senior staff writer for Space News, and his colleague, Deborah Werner, the Silicon Valley correspondent for that great magazine and our media partner. Jason and Deborah, welcome. Hi there. It's great to have you, and uh, I appreciate you taking a look at uh, the obvious 800-pound uh, gorilla in the room for everyone, uh, the economy. Um, one thing I, I've been maintaining all along is that from the perspective of employment, this is not an industry where you saw a great resignation. This is one where people continue to rush through the door to work. And so in many ways it's unique, but you're going to tell me through your reporting whether in fact I'm accurate and uh, what we're looking at in terms of the overall uh, impact of some of these economic uh, squeezes that we've been experiencing. So Jason, I'm gonna turn it over to you first. And again, many thanks to you and Space News for making the time for us today. Absolutely, thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah, I'm going to ground things a bit, I think, before your discussion on meditation and alternative ways of looking uh, on thinking about space, because it's been a challenging time for the space industry in recent years, to put it lightly. Uh, and just as markets were finally emerging from a pandemic that has disrupted workforces and global supply chains, the industry was hit with soaring inflation, high energy costs, and other economic headwinds. We've seen a slowdown in activity in the public markets, 
and there have been many reports of layoffs across the broader technology sector. Um, but for this month's significant digits report, I want to highlight analysis that Space Capital recently put out on private investments in the space industry. Space Capital is an early stage space investor based in New York, um, but they also put out these market research reports uh, every quarter that I encourage everyone to, to seek out. They have a, a very handy interactive dashboard that I play around with a lot. Um, but according to their data, the number of private investments in space related companies fell 35% in the second quarter of this year, compared with the uh, same period in 2021. And the amount of money invested in Q2 also declined down 38% overall compared with last year. However, Space Capital believes the capital markets are now at a crossroads where these strong economic headwinds are meeting potential recovery signs. They say at least some of the slowdown was caused by venture capitalists taking the summer off to wait for valuations to stabilize. Uh, these investors still have significant funds that they're itching to deploy uh, and will likely be encouraged by strong employment growth statistics that we're seeing in the US right now. Despite the layoffs, uh, employers hired far more workers than expected in June. Uh, and while space capital expects the macro environment will disproportionately constrain funding for launch and emerging space industries over the next one to three years. They say the space economy as a whole is not at uh, existential risk. The majority of space companies out there are actually uh, counter cyclical and have proved resilient to, to macro conditions. Um, space capital pointed to how uh, satellite communications, navigation, geospatial intelligence, these are all already playing a critical role in underpinning most major industries. And despite the slowdown, they say $6.1 billion was still invested in space companies in the second quarter. Uh, about a quarter of those funds, however, went to SpaceX, which is definitely one of those companies that buck macro trends. Uh, now, also, when Space Couple talks about space companies, they also include companies like Uber, uh, which provides services that are very dependent on space. So they have a very broad scope. Um, the money secured by companies they categorize as space infrastructure, which might be what most people would deem as a space company. So those building hardware and software to build, launch and operate space based assets was two point five billion dollars. But again, without SpaceX, that would have been just below $800 million for Q2. So the big, the big takeaway is it appears we are looking at a shift to a more conservative investment landscape going forward. There's still money out there, but the more risky ventures will likely lose out. Uh, how that impacts the stellar pace of innovation that we've seen in the industry for many years now uh, remains to be seen. Uh, and there are other obstacles that will need to be overcome to expand the future space economy too, not least hiring challenges that a lot of high tech industries have been struggling with for a while now, which my colleague Deborah is really keen to uh, talk about next. But yeah, Lou, the, it, it's interesting. The space uh, mm. industry seems somewhat shielded. Um, we're hearing all the time how difficult it is for employers to find um, workers. Uh, so, you know, it's, it definitely speaks volumes to the, the current state of the market. Jason, thanks again. I mean, that, that's just a terrific report. Um, before we, we go out to Silicon Valley and talk to Deborah, um, this, is earning, this is earnings week, right? Um, I think 14% of the companies had reported yesterday. Um, are, are you seeing anything with some of those companies, uh, those categories that you had uh, mentioned that is surprising to anyone? Um, no, at the moment, no, no. We're seeing a lot of big government contracts, actually, um, on the contrary. Um, uh, and, and that also is um, somewhere a, a part of the space industry that helps shield it from what we're seeing in the general macroeconomic environment, because it is mm. still um, significantly supported by, by governments across the world. And so that will likely shield it from the worst of the effects of a, of a recession if we re-enter that, for instance. Yeah. And of course, we've got the whole question about, uh, you know, value companies are sort of ruling the day probably. But, you know, as, as Dylan Taylor uh, told us, you know, a couple of months ago, what happens 
when we have to make investments that are that are going to be stretched out over 90 years or so? What, what in the world is a significant digits report going to look like then? <laughs> uh, That'll be a lot grayer, probably. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But you'll still be here, right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, good. Um, again, thanks, Jason, for that report. Um, so we'll go out to Silicon Valley now, and Deborah Werner is standing by. Deborah, what's what's going on out there? Any headwinds that are pushing you you off the road? Well, no. In fact, um, I did look into the hiring question a little bit, and in the most recent space report, which comes from the Space Foundation. They said there were 152,000 people in the space industry in 2021, and that that had not slowed in spite of the pandemic. Um, and when I talk to people, hiring is their number one concern. Supply chain is an issue, but their number one issue is hiring. Um, I spoke with someone at Raytheon recently. They need 1,000 people in Southern California to join Raytheon. Um, I talk to startups every day that need two people or 10 people or 20 people. And the problem is not so much new college graduates. They are flocking to the industry. Um, but people with five years experience or 10 years experience, um, it seems like there are just not enough of those to go around. So they're poaching them from each other and it's creating a, a very dynamic hiring picture. Yeah, well, Deborah, any sense of where they where they are? Are they in other industries? Um, or are well, they just not qualified enough yet? Um, I looked at the NASA figures because they really break it down by age group. And, and so NASA reports 18,000 workers and 9,000 of those, half of those are over 50 years old. So I think there was a lot more hiring years ago when people flocked to the industry and then a slowdown for a long time. And now it has to build up again, the experience. Um, it, not too long ago, people wanted to go work for Google instead of the space sector because it wasn't considered exciting or sexy. I think that's changed, but it still needs the workers. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I mean, it, it definitely is sexy. Um, and Google's in the space business too. I mean, it just about everybody is now. So um, it, as um, Jason was saying, you know, how are you defining the space industry? Um, we're, we're kind of everywhere. Okay, Deborah, that's great. Thanks again for uh, My pleasure. the report. We really appreciate, um, again, Space News uh, coming out and leading us off here. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague and friend, Joe Fargnoli, in uh, the greatest region in the world, the Finger Lakes, Rochester. Today, Joe, um, you know, Alon Levin's with us today from Lockheed Martin and, and other uh, companies. We should probably be asking him about some of this uh, as we get into this as well, get his take on it. But um, I think we're going to be talking about bigger things as well now that we've got sort of the picture from from earth from our friends at space news what do you think i think you're on mute joe yeah just to recall when we first started talking about this topic uh, we kind of scratched our heads why would we want to talk about meditation in space it, it sounds like the, the two are really very unrelated um and as we started to uh, explore this you, you kind of enlightened me as to the fact that space is not just another industry, right? There is a giant leap that we're trying to take here, you know, physically in moving into cislunar space and, you know, transforming our economy by expanding the, the domain of human activity. Um, and that's all great. And that really excites people. But we kind of suspected that under the surface was a deeper yearning, a yearning for perhaps a different way for humans to function, for humans to interact perhaps a, a new system under which we could consider creating broader peace and prosperity for more people. And I know that sounds really flowery, but we're, remember, we also talked about, you know, uh, historically when people have, you know, transversed great distances and search for a different and better life. I mean, we think of the formation of this country. Um, there's a lot of different things that can be discussed on how well that was really done. But it is in the human spirit to yearn for something substantially better, to take a giant leap forward. And as we looked at that, we asked ourselves, what fuels that yearning? What guides it? 
And we both realize that both you and I are, we both practice daily meditation and that helps us to set our ethos. It helps us to set what we want to do, how we do it. And um, it gives us the courage to dare greatly and to try to take big leaps. But we also recognize that, you know, when you try to take a big leap, sometimes you fall on your face, right? And sometimes you take a big leap, but then you don't take the second one. So that's where this whole idea of the middle weight came up, right? How do we develop this smooth cadence in this industry? So we're always firing through successes, through failures. And this industry becomes kind of self-healing where we don't, you know, criticize folks who fail and we don't worship those who succeed. We try to create a community of support. And as, as Deborah and uh, Jason mentioned, you know, people will be attracted to that community. Space will be cool, not just because, you know, we launch big rockets, but because we've got an ethos and it's a community in which people will want to work. So as you finally convinced me that this was a worthwhile topic and we, you know, kind of came to that common vision, we said to ourselves, well, you know, who can we talk to? Who can we bring into this? And before I kind of introduce our first two speakers, I want to read a quote from Theodore Roosevelt. It's called The Man in the Arena. I'm sure many people are familiar with it. It says, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena or the woman whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood. And it goes on and on. So when we thought about that, we thought about you know, two of our industry associates and friends, um, Steve Wolf and uh, Lon Levin. These are two gentlemen who have been in the industry for a long time, you know, 30 plus years, and who have got pretty significant accomplishments. So what I'd like to do is do a, a quick introduction to them and give them the chance to describe, you know, their experiences along the lines of the theme that I'm describing here and that of what you've talked about as well, Lou. Sure. So yeah. first, let me start with Lon. Um, you know, Lon is currently the co-founder. I'm Lon is, I'm sorry, the co-founder of XM Satellite and several space industry associations. He is now with Lockheed Martin Space Systems. Um, he has played a key role in the development of a bunch of communication uh, companies, including XM Canada, uh, Motion Corporation, American, American Mobile Satellite, and Terrastar. Um, throughout the 90s, um, he served as a delegate at the UN's International Telecommunications Union Conferences, negotiating technology treaties. Uh, he was also a committee member of NASA's Advisory Council, the Planetary Society's Board of Directors, and the Department of Defense's Defense Business Board. Um, his range goes far beyond that, which is why we happen to like him so much. Uh, Lon was on the board of directors of the Cultural Development Corporation of Washington, D.C., which helped artists secure affordable housing and workspaces. Um, so Lon's very deeply experienced. And from what I hear, Lon is not afraid to share his viewpoints. So part of the, the ethos of the New York Space Business Roundtable is that we put it out there. At times, the clash of differing opinion gives us a spark of truth. But we, we love Lon's contributions, look forward to a great uh, contribution from him here. I also want to introduce our good friend, Mr. Steve Wolf. Um, Steve is an industry veteran and author, and I'm going to start out here letting Steve describe a little more about his background. But Steve was also a pioneer in the industry with the Spacecom conference down in Houston, which for a number of years has provided uh, great interaction between the greater community and the, the, the NASA community in Houston. So to get going here, I'm going to have both of these gentlemen describe their perspectives on this viewpoint. But maybe, Steve, you want to kick us off with a little more um, depth on your background and your perspective on what sets the space industry apart and how our individual practices help us create a greater and better space industry overall that is truly attractive to people wanting to come into. Thanks, Joe. And, and Steve, when you're done with that, we're going to actually uh, hear from uh, Nicole Stott, who uh, is also with us, but she pre-recorded because uh, she's on vacation. So. Steve? Want to show that now, or did you want to want me to go on? Want me to kick in? Um, you want me to just yeah, go for it? Yeah, why don't you just go for it, and then we'll hear from okay. uh, Nicole because right, well, you're, you're, you're an author <laughs> too. You're an author too. You already mentioned yeah. that. Yeah, I look forward to hearing from from Nicole as I do. And uh, you know, Joe, thank you so much uh, for those kind words, and and, and Lou, you guys have been uh, good friends of mine. Uh, you, Joe, you mentioned my background uh, was with uh, with. Uh, uh, Spacecom, which uh, was a organ, which was a commercial space conference that was based in in 
uh, in use for a number of years, uh, starting in 2015. We continue with that. Um, I'm actually not associated with that organization. An offshoot of Spacecom, though, I am the exec uh, I am the deputy executive director for the Global Spaceport Alliance. Uh, that's an organization of space representing spaceport operators around the world. Um, but um, but I actually began my career in Washington D.C. Um, working for Congressman George Brown, late Congressman George Brown, as a an aide on space policy. Um, and I think it was around it was in. in you know, just to sort of dive into the, the, the meditation component of this, you know, my, I, I would have to say that the, my meditation practice definitely has informed um, the trajectory of my career and, the, and, and what I have looked to focus on, right? So we could say that we're very interested in, um, say, space, for example, as a general topic, but what are we going to do within that context and so when um, when I was in uh, when I was in, in in college, I was was I came to college interested in space, but I also um, I also started um, a transcendental meditation practice there, and um, and that helped me to to recognize that uh, uh, my true passion for space, and I wound up. Um, founding uh, a local chapter of the then uh, L5 Society, uh, for those older of us are familiar with that. And um, that helped me to sort of uh, center myself around this passion, lifelong passion for, you know, what do we need to do? Uh, what do I need to do to contribute to this effort to expand human life beyond Earth and to begin to populate the, uh, the solar system and beyond with human uh, life and civilization? Um, and that brought me to, to George's office to, to, uh, uh, to, to work on space policy, where, um, where I worked on the NASA budget for a number of years. But in a moment of um, towards the end of my tenure, about three or four years into my tenure there, I contemplated, well, what kind of contrib contribution can I make in this moment in, in time you know, before I leave the Hill or go on to do something else? And it really was through through meditation and contemplation uh, that I came up with the, an idea for the for the Space Settlement Act of 1988, and that was a, a, a piece of legislation that recognized that that space settlement was a natural outcome of all of our activities in space. Um, fortunately, the Congressman Brown uh, agreed with me; thought it was a great idea. Um, we introduced the bill. We lobbied for the bill. Uh, the committee that he served on incorporated the essence of that bill into the then NASA authorization measure that was signed into law by Ronald Reagan. Um, I should mention that actually the current administrator, Bill Nelson, was the chairman of the subcommittee at that time. So, um, you know, things seem to come full circle. Yeah. Um, so I so over the years I've I've contributed so I've, over the years I've contributed uh, to the uh, to to the space industry either as professionally or as an as an advocate in in one way or another helping to um, advance this the, this cause and of course um, of course I think now at the end of sort of well end ish towards of my career so. Um, um, once again, I contemplated what, you know, what, what, what should I be doing, right? Again, looking towards a contemplation and meditation to help to inform your actions. And that's where, you know, we, where, long story short, developed the concept for the Beyond Earth Institute, which is a policy think tank that is, is focused on a mission of creating a policy framework that will right. eventually enable, uh, economically vibrant communities beyond earth. And we've been very, very successful so far in two years into our program. Uh, we have, a, we have a, an excellent program actually coming up tomorrow. And then this fall, October 13th, we're gonna be meeting in person in Washington DC for our first in-person uh, gathering. So um, again, it's about what can we do in this time, in this moment that we have that is going to advance us because very much like you, Joe, 
Um, you know, I, I hold, you know, it, it is not just a job, right? And, and getting into space and, and the exploration of space is about something bigger than just the, the rockets and the footprints, right? It's about a, a transition period that human life is going through. Uh, and I think the more that we can be conscious of that transition, right? Hold the, the, the nature of that transition, uh, the more effective we're gonna be in our jobs in the space community and more, and, and, and more passionate we will be about that. So I'll leave it there. No, thanks, Stephen. And again, you've, you've really built that bridge between sort of the mystical elements of the human experience, the necessity of those, and policy now, now getting there so that, uh, you know, the, the people who build um, can continue to build. And again, we'll be hearing from, from Lon Levin, who's one of those people shortly. Um, I should add Frank White, um, who Steve works with as well, uh, the author of The Overview Effect and really our, our kind of our guru in this, this space, no pun intended, was scheduled to be here. He produced a paper for discussion here today, but he had to, uh, he had a medical emergency. So he's in an emergency room right now with a member of his family. So we, we wish uh, uh, Frank well, and uh, oh, that's his wife. So we wish them both uh, well. He's going to join us if he can, but we were really looking forward to having him join us. So uh, we, we miss Frank, but we'll have him back for you. Um, Lon, I'm going to show a video that Nicole Stott sent us because she's on holiday. Uh, she wanted to be here as well. And then I'm going to ask you to react to it. So here we go. Go ahead, Matt. Hi, everyone. I'm Nicole Stott. And while I can't join live today, I am happy to be able to send greetings from one of the most beautiful places on the planet. Very moment of Zen. My family and some dear friends have been immersing ourselves in the terrestrial and inner space awe and wonder of Bonaire. Spending time hiking through the contrasting tropical and desert mix of the terrain, diving in the crystal clear blue water, taking in the bon air, and taking time to chill in a place like this where I'm recording today. Awe and wonder are the two words I'd like to focus on. Experiencing the view out the window of the space station was awesome and wonderful. I discovered very quickly that it was a form of meditation for me and it helped me better be prepared for every day in space. And it's something that I've carried with me every day since coming back to Earth. Now, whether through the windows of a spaceship looking back at Earth or through the little window of a scuba mask, or perhaps most importantly, in our daily lives and our own backyards, opening up our hearts and minds to the awe and wonder that surrounds us every day is grounding and centering and helps provide balance in our lives that we can use positively to be better prepared to appreciate the joys in life and to deal with the challenges that come our way. This appreciation of awe and wonder is an approach that's based on inspiration and exploration and I would also argue is a call to action. And I think there are many aspects to this and how we bring our humanity along with us to all the places we're inspired to explore and then what action we take as a result. You'll be hearing from my dear friend Frank White today and about his wonderful overview effect philosophy. As we travel further in space, the understanding and acknowledgement of the overview effect will become even more important. The need to proactively consider the human in human spaceflight and the impact on the human as a result. How do we appreciate the significance of the overview effect when what it's based on, the view of Earth from space, is not a view of Earth that looks like Earth as we know it anymore? So, so much to think about and consider, but I think it will still hold true that our exploration of space for the future will still be ultimately for the benefit of all life on Earth. And the benefit is a result of how we as humans, as Earthlings, take action as a result. My overview effect lessons are pretty simple. Things we all know, but perhaps need to incorporate more actively into our daily lives. And they are, we live on a planet. We are all Earthlings. And the only border that matters is that thin blue line of atmosphere that blankets and protects us all. By appreciating the awe and wonder that surrounds us, and by behaving like crewmates, not passengers, we have the power to create a future for all life on Earth that's as beautiful as it looks from space. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Lon Levin, um, 
your, um, your overview effect lessons are many as well, but I, I'm going to guess, and welcome, by the way, I'm going to guess that you didn't hear anything there that you disagree with, and you probably want to riff on that a little bit. Welcome. Thank you, and uh, thank you. I, I think we should tell uh, everyone Lou, that, um, that the way this all started, at least why I'm here, is was one day Lou and I were talking about meditation, and right. uh, what I want to talk about is what Lou and I talked about in the beginning and how it led to uh, why, I, why I'm here today. Uh, to me, meditation, which I've, by the way, done since I'm 17. I was 17 years old. Should I tell you why? 1972. Um, I have been uh, do, doing this. You can do the math. Um, I have been um, doing this now for all those years, and I, I continue to do it. And I'm going to start small and then get real big here. Uh, what Nicole said, I can imagine being on the space station and having to be excited and quieting yourself down at the same exact time. And um, the practical small effect of meditation for me has been that I um, continue to travel around the world. In fact, I'm about to go to the UK in a few hours. I'm glad I could squeeze this in. Um, I uh, travel uh, a lot, mostly for business. And throughout my life, what meditation has meant to me, meant to me, is that it has taught me how to quiet my body. It really is a very practical thing that meditation does. Now, I enjoy it for the rest. It gives me, but even more important, at almost all times, not, I take it back, not all times, sometimes other things can overwhelm me, but Mostly, I know that I can quiet myself down. I can sleep almost anywhere, which is my business superpower. I can go anywhere, take a quick nap, because I know I can sleep, and I know I can rest. And I imagine, as Nicole was talking, that the practical effect of learning how to meditate and quiet your body, that no matter how good our Equal systems are going to be, and our, our ability to survive in other places, we still are going to need to quiet ourselves down. And I think that's where the people who can meditate, whether it's transcendental meditation, which I've been doing all these years, um, or other kinds of meditation, and again, I, I don't judge, it's different, different ways to meditate, but all with the same purpose, and that is to quiet one down. But then, if I can get a bit bigger, um, I think sometimes meditation this is what it means to me personally. Like I, I, I can't tell whether, um, and I, I'll never know where the lines are. The part of just personality traits, part of it's meditation, but do you meditation because of your personality traits? I don't want to get into that circle too much, but the fact is, is that when I think about what I do and how excited I get some days when I go, I can't believe I'm working on the space station. Then I got to work on this lunar communication system. Then I'm doing this, and, then I'm, and I'm voting them all at the same time. Or I'm working on XM radio. These, these were exciting projects. But at the very same point, I always think to myself, I'm just a cog. I'm just, a, I'm a lucky cog, but I'm just a cog in the wheel where all these people, all those, I forget the numbers, 162 million people working in space. They're all doing the same thing. We're all trying to figure out different ways that we could advance our civilization into space. And every one of those people matter. And again, I don't know if it's meditation or not that helps me understand that, but I just see myself as it's my job, like everyone else's, let's figure out how many ways we can get off the planet because every time we do, we learn more and more how to do it and how to go further. Um, that's my point. So. Yeah. And again, Jen, Lon, I've heard it a few times, but I think it's, it, it is absolutely right. Joe, it's, it, you know, what Lon's saying is really to be expansive, we have to get sort of smaller in a way, which is what meditation allows us to do, put the ego to the side. And, you know, nobody's a better team builder than he is, but the connection between meditation and expansion of the, of the human experience and commercial endeavor into space isn't a frivolous one, right? No, exactly. Exactly. And I really have a lot of respect and regard for both, uh, both stories that Steve and Lon shared. And it's very interesting to hear those stories and realize that really from a state of, I'll call it nothingness, 
inspiration ideas came to them that they were then able to instantiate. And that's really why I respect both of them so much. They're not just ideas people, right? There are people who are smart enough to know that their ideas are limited. So they've developed a practice to seek a broader ocean of ideas and inspiration. But beyond that, they've developed the practical skills in this industry to canalize those energies, to, to direct them into constructive organizations and activities and starting companies or spin outs. And that is really what just I find to be thrilling about this industry. And for those listening, again, if you're still wondering, why do these guys pick this topic? I believe it's exactly for that reason. So I think as we listen to Steve and Lon talk about experiences of where you know, they faced an intractable problem and they thought about what space could do to benefit humanity and they turned it over to nothingness and said, you know, and they got this, this, this breeze of confirmation and they were, had the courage to go out and try to instantiate that, that inspiration into, you know, practical matters. You know, Steve talked about working through a congressman to bring, for, bring forward legislation. You know, uh, Lon and his sleep have start, has started great companies that have been very successful. You know, so going from nothingness to somethingness and, and space being that vehicle to do that is super exciting. Any more experiences like that, Steve, you can share? Because as you see, these things, these stories jazz me up. I, I really like them. And I think they're beneficial to folks who are listening in because this space gives us a huge lever arm to take those inspirations and ideas and turn them into things that can benefit many people on earth. And, and that's a great question, Joe. And to layer that, Steve, Tell us about the work you're doing in policy and how that might inform investment and psychological uh, changes to the way we, we build out into space. And then we'll ask Ron basically the same question. I think you're on mute, uh, Steve. So I love what, what Lon is talking about. It's this, the, the centering quality, being able to be at peace in any environment uh, and that is a huge piece of, you know, the benefits of, of, of meditation. Um, and certainly, and I think you, you, all of you guys, I think could, could understand for those, for those days, and hopefully they're rare days that you don't do your meditation practice, usually things start going a little sideways or, and then you turn around and say, oh, okay, I didn't do my meditation. But, but sometimes when you're in a nice practice and things are just going like, are, you know, the wheels are just turning nice and smoothly for you. And then you have to also say, you know, okay, that's, that's the meditation. Um, and so that's so important as, as a practice. Um, as in a, a place that informs you, as I, as I was mentioning, um, that, that, that also can't, can't be understated. So there's an opportunity when you're in meditation to go into meditation with, with challenges, with problems, with with questions about what to do, and uh, you know it doesn't always work. But if you're if you're with it and you're you're asking and you're and and and, and over time you see you see that value. Um, I would say that uh, I, I think that the um, you know asking for additional experiences uh, the um, uh, <laughs> Well, this is this is a you know it's well it's hard to to. Well, Steve, I'm, I'll 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 jump in and, and yeah, you know, please ask do. you for an additional experience because you mentioned yeah when things are going great or you feel you know a certain something it's it's meditation. But <clears throat> I remember uh, there's this old story about uh, the psychologist Carl Jung, and a patient came into him one time and he said, uh, "Gee, you know things are going well. I I just invented uh, you know a new space satellite radio service." I just uh, inherited a billion dollars. I just got married. And, and the psychologist said, well, we'll hang in there. We'll help you get through this. Um, it's also true. It's also true that you really learn your practice when you have a failure. And there are plenty of failures in the space commercial business because of the nature of what we do, right? So maybe talk to us a little bit about an experience of how you get through a failure as opposed yeah. to crashing emotionally. You can stay in the middle. You can stay balanced. Oh yeah, I mean, and uh, you know, in, in in what we do, there's always there's always disappointment. Um, you know, just with Beyond Earth Institute, you know, we are a uh, an emerging nonprofit, right? So we, you know, there's you're constantly reaching out um, to folks with a message with a with a fundamental message about human expansion into space. So you're going to, you know, 
I'm very encouraged by how many people actually are resonating with that message far more than I expected. But every time you run into somebody that is, you know, looks at you sideways or you, or is, um, was trying to diminish what you're doing, you feel this wave of, you know, and, and again, everyone is different in terms of what the, you know, the demons that they're, they're dealing with the waves of, of questioning oneself. Is this, is this correct? Should I be doing this or when things aren't going right? So it's really uh, that practice of, you know, this too shall pass, um, mm. accepting, you, you learn to accept the pain of the rejection or, or, or the failure, right? And allowing that, recognizing that emotions that accompany that are, are just that, right? Emotions exactly, that, then, yeah. that then pass through you, you know, you accept it, you you take it for what it is. Maybe there's something you need to learn from that. You take that, you learn from it, let it pass. And then you just go on. Then you just go on to the next thing. Yeah. Transients, the champagne bubbles, that helps. The float. Yeah. yeah, no, that's right. The transients. Lon, uh, you know, you, you've been, you know, you've been at the, in the saddle for a lot of these ventures. Um, but, you know, again, to, to talk about the frustrations and how meditating from the time you were a teenager had, had, might have worked you through those and helped you actually get more creative. Any experiences like that you can share? I, I think let's just talk about what meditation is and then I, I can make my point pretty easily. I think almost all of us, whether we meditate or not, do real well on a good night's sleep. We all can appreciate that. We can appreciate not a good night's sleep, but when our body is calmer. Don't get me wrong, there are times you could be loaded up with coffee and you're zipping and you can do some pretty cool things. <laughs> but, um, and I've experienced that too. But it's, it's more that what meditation keeps on reminding you is, is that, again, I'm going back to what I already said, is that you can't quiet your body down. You can get good rest. You can keep on moving forward. And, and so I'm really, this is more of a health discussion and a space discussion, but now going to space, uh, you know, I've been involved in a number of um, a number of space startups, and like any startup, and space has the same issues, and then more so sometimes. There, there are great challenges every day, just trying to knock down the obstacle in front of you, and you still don't know whether you survive. And in the meantime, you're trying to raise money, and you try to keep people together and move forward. But all of that requires both perseverance and calm, and um, I, I can just say with, you know, sometimes there are near-death experiences. Hey, Frank's here. Um, sometimes there are, are near-death experiences. Sometimes um, uh, you are happy, by the way. I mean, then you're thrilled. And you all, you learn how to even out. What I, what I like about what you said, and actually, you and I were talking about this the other day, uh, yeah. and you talked about that quote, which is a great quote. You're like, like, things are never as bad as they seem, and things are never as good as they seem. Um, and, and every day you keep on rolling through it and you try to be as even as you can. And I think if you have a technique, going back to what the conversation is, that allows you to maintain that all the better because you can lead better, you can work better, and you can um, ultimately um, live better because you're thinking about it in a more balanced way. But what's helping you, and this is the physical part of it, is you're meditating. You have a meditation, you have a way to quiet your body down. Uh, yep. Uh, <clears throat> Joe, um, excuse me, Frank White has joined us. Frank, welcome. Thank you, Lou. Great, great to see you here. And uh, I know it's been a challenging day for you. So we really appreciate seeing your smiling face. And, and we were talking about a subject that's quite familiar to you, um, our, our own overview effect, which we're calling a meditation. Um, but hey, well, I've got you. Let me let's jump right in. Um, you know, you just put out that paper that was terrific, and you talk about <clears throat> a caring capacity. Right. And I'm just, yeah. I'm just going to throw, I'm just going to throw those two words out there, so yeah. that you can, you can, you can pick it up from here. Oh, thank you. Let so us much. know what you meant. Yeah. So I'm just outside the hospital. Kind of noisy here. I hope you can hear me. Can you? We can. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Well, you know, I have been interested since the 70s in the whole question of carrying capacity of the earth. 
And that all began with uh, computer modeling being done by the Club of Rome uh, study. And they, they saw several opportunities for the human civilization to overwhelm the carrying capacity of the planet. And later they did further studies and they said, we think it's happening. We think, you know, we are overwhelming it. And that really began Gerard K. O'Neill to start his work on space communities and the Space Studies Institute, because he saw a solution or a response that would include both environmental benefits and space development. And I have recently gone back to all of that and looked at what was being said then. I've looked at other studies. I really feel strongly that humanity moving into a phase of large scale space migration is not simply a nice thing for space devotees to do. I really think it's a, an environmental imperative uh, to begin to move significant numbers of people and industries out into a larger ecosystem and we're not leaving the earth. The earth is part of the solar ecosystem. Uh, we are simply spreading uh, the challenge of human civilization over a much broader territory. That's, a, that's kind of a quick summary of the paper. Uh, but I think the most important part of it is to have a cognitive shift from, oh, you know, a bunch of people like Wu and Frank and Tamara, they want to go live in outer space. Isn't that nice? I'd like for it to shift more to a human um, uh, project, you know, kind of a, a central project for us all. That's part of what the human space program is all about. Lou, you're talking and we can't hear you. I'm sorry. Thanks, Frank. I'm going to ask Matt to put up a slide from, from your paper. It's a quote. Um, it's that fourth slide because we, we excerpted some of the things. Uh, that I, I you... have it, Lou. <laughs> okay. So, um, Joe, do you have a question for Frank before we get that up? Then yeah. we can respond to that. Oh, well, there it is. Well, why don't we take the chart first and then I have a, do have a question for Frank. Okay. Um, Frank, you'll recognize this quote. And, and again, um, Alana and Steve are also welcome to respond to it. But one of the things you say in there is some would argue that new technology, stronger social controls, and positive behavior changes will be enough to reduce the human impact on Terra, which you, you suggest Earth should be called you know, instead of Earth. Uh, they suggest that we put as much energy into creating a more balanced relationship with Terra as we would put into uh, settling human and, humans in other parts of the solar system. Is, is that what you really believe? Is that what you're really proposing? Or is that just something that people are saying? Well, I'm in favor of that, actually. I mean, I think that's what the overview effect is all about, is beginning to see how we do need to change our relationship to the Earth. And that's essentially an environmental imperative. So I think we have to do that. And I just don't see it as either or. I see it all as part of the same uh, you know, process. But yeah. one, one thing I would say I'm not in favor of, and this goes back to O'Neill and the Club of Rome, what he saw was stronger social controls would be the answer for many people. That is to say, liberate, I mean, uh, restrict liber uh, uh, freedom, uh, restrict uh, liberty, restrict opportunity for people in the name of saving the planet. And if there's another option, which is expansion, which actually will be a, a great adventure uh, for those who, who want it, I think that should be a part of the solution. So I don't propose, I don't propose large scale space migration as the only answer 
I think we have to stop doing a lot of things we're doing on planet Earth as well. However, I think it should be a tool, uh, an important right. tool. Right. I, Joe, I'm also hearing Frank say that we need to be, in the words of a, of a, of a Tibetan uh, monk that I read, uh, much more expansive, both intellectually, spiritually, and psychically, to, yeah. to accomplish some of these things that these three guys are talking about. Yeah, I agreed. And, and Frank, I, we have, uh, you know, 30 or so uh, space entrepreneurs on this line. And I wanted to give you a chance to maybe give them some insight and, you know, God forbid, advice as to how to create perhaps a daily practice, a, a daily um, discipline around moving ourselves to the frame of mind that you're suggesting, because it doesn't just happen instantaneously. It doesn't, you don't just snap your fingers and your mindset has changed. It takes a daily effort and a daily practice to create that shift. Sometimes it's through, you know, direct meditation. Sometimes it's through association with others or inspiration from readings. You're going to impact 30 or so space entrepreneurs here. What can you share with us? Well, first of all, if, if I were a very good entrepreneur, I would probably be taking on a different role in, in the whole <laughs> space enterprise. So I don't know if I can give them any good advice. However, I would say, first of all, I am a meditator. Many of the people I know uh, in the space world are meditators. And I believe it's a tremendously useful tool. Um, I happen to be initiated into transcendental meditation in the 70s. And I also do Zen meditation. And I just fall into a meditative state when I get stressed, like when I'm at the hospital. Yeah. Uh, I begin meditating. I don't just sit on a cushion and meditate. So I would, I would urge everybody to check that out. Um, the other thing I would say is, Try to accomplish something every day, but not everything every day. Um, I do a little bit of work on my writing every day, Joseph. And uh, it's amazing how many books you can write if you just make progress every day. Um, I don't really say, oh, I can't work on that book today because I don't have time. Mm -hmm. My approach is, I can write a page today or a paragraph and you can write a lot of books that way. And I guess the third thing I would say is be prepared for epiphanies or new ideas. Almost all of my books, including and the paper that you shared, it's happened after I have built up a huge amount of interest in a subject I've done a lot of reading, I've gotten a lot of input, and then pow, pop, I can see it clearly. And everything just becomes uh, obvious what I should do. Mm -hmm. I think that can work in business as well. You know, if you just keep working at it day by day, eventually you have that breakthrough and then you can shift the direction and go after it. So. I guess those are my three, uh, you know, I'm an entrepreneur of ideas. Those are your three noble truths, Frank? Yeah, those are my three noble truths for entrepreneurs. <laughs> so, hey, uh, well, let's go, let's go to Juan then. Um, you know, again, feel free to riff off that. But I, I have to ask you a question. So you've been meditating since you were a teenager, 17. Um, do you think you would have developed um, XM satellite radio the way you did without the meditation experience? <laughs> Ah, I always wanted to ask you that question. I, I, the, the, the answer is, of course, we'll never know, right? Um, right. I mean, I was, <laughs> right. you know, I was a musician already. I was, uh, and still am. Um, and then I became a space guy and was in the space satellite business um, purpose, purposefully. Uh, I, I guess... I, I, I'll never know the answer to that question. I can only say how meditation has helped me in my career. However, right. uh, starting from the top again, and um, I, I'm not gonna credit, I, I, I can't answer your question like I know the answer to it, but I can observe that just being in this industry 
uh, as, as are my colleagues here. We all talk about the meditation that we do. And there's Frank, who also has been meditating since the 70s, just like me. Um, uh, I, I think it just allows you to continue to be in um, these type of industries that have both um, uh, vision, they're doing new things, yet they also learn the patience of everything is one step at a time. And for all the entrepreneurs on the phone, that's really what it's about. It's about having your vision, seeing where you're going, and at the same time, um, uh, be able to just build things brick by brick and, and having that awareness that you're building brick by brick. So, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of a chicken and egg thing. I don't really have an answer to your question. I do know it's helped me in my career and continues to all the time. And I imagine that anyone, like everyone, all jobs are tough and, and we're fortunate to be in the space industry. Um, uh, we all, we, actually what we're fortunate to be is in an industry that we love. There are other industries that people love. My daughter's in biotech, she loves it. Um, and just as much, has just as much passion as I do in that space. Um, but to have that is great. But then, of course, uh, other people have other jobs, and still meditation can help them, I believe. But that being said, when I create XM Radio, otherwise, I'll never know. I'm sorry I can't answer your question, Lou, except to say it happened. I meditate. So Yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> and, and um, you know, again, it's there aren't easy there are no answers to any of this we just ask questions and that's um that's kind of how we go forward uh, i'm gonna we're gonna put up the big question we're we're gonna run a little bit over today in honor of frank white because uh, frank was able to join us um so you can all uh, definitely join in on this one to answer the question hey steve i'm gonna i'm gonna turn it over to you on this um mm -hmm. there's just to continue on what frank and lon were saying there's going to come a point where um, we're going to be like in between Mars and the Earth as part of that mission. And, and someone is going to be there looking at both of those little balls and realize that they've been totally dislocated from home. I mean, it's going to probably look a little like the expanse uh, in the early days. Sure. How, how do you stay in the middle way through those successes and challenges while continuing to, as Frank uh, and Lon both said, you know, write one page a day toward the future. Yeah, because you're, you're now you're talking about the potential for large numbers of people, you know, expanding out, going to Mars. And inevitably, um, there'll be a certain percentage of that of that group that will that uh, maybe they will freak out. They won't be able to uh, they may miss home, want to come back. Um, I, I do think that those um, those travelers who have either a meditation practice or by disposition, so we all know by disposition, they they intuitively understand how to regulate themselves and how to how to stay on this middle 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 path. I think NASA and uh, those who would put together these trips to Mars and uh, with large numbers of people are well, would be well served to incorporate um, a meditative practice in the preparation process, in the training process, so that, um, so that folks, you know, have better tools to psychologically, you know, manage whatever might come, because I think there's still a lot of unknowns. Um, and, uh, I, you know, and I do want to add that, uh, you know, I, I do feel that there is a that there is uh, an, an undercurrent of, of purpose taking place. So we're sort of the our expansion into space is something that humans were meant to do, and I actually articulate that in in the beyond in the in uh, the obligation where uh, and I and and so in that way, I think that the more folks in the space industry who would be willing to go to that center, right? Go to that place of nothingness through, through meditation um, can find a, a special kind of inspiration that will elevate uh, their interest in, in space and perhaps inform a little bit better, maybe a lot better, you know, what, what they should be doing. And, I, and, and this sort of gets to what, 
what uh, what Frank was mentioning a little bit ago that you know achieving that moment of euphoria, that aha moment, um, that not only tells you what you, you should do, but also puts you on on the right path, right? Because as as he says, there there are many thousands of us, and I think Alon mentioned this, there are many many thousands of us in the space industry, and we're all sort of pushing at that rock, you know, up up the hill. Well, some people might be pushing a little bit sideways. Some people might be at the top of the rock pushing down. And the more we could, the more we're all sort of in unison and meditating, perhaps we can kind of, kind of all more of us can be pushing, pushing from the right side and getting to that goal uh, much more quickly. Well said. Joe, the, uh, the obligation, Steve's book has, reveals an ancient secret, by the way, just if you haven't read it yet. <laughs> which one? Yeah. The obligation, Steve's book. <laughs> no, which ancient secret? Yeah. Well, he can't, he can't tell you. You got to read the read book. The book. <laughs> right. You got to buy the book. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, Alon, I, you know, by all means, I will, I'll get in touch with you and I'll, I'll send you, I'm happy to send you a copy of this. I'd, I'd love for you to, to, to look at, look it through. It, it yeah. very much uh, speaks to uh, what Frank was saying that it's not just about us going into outer space. We also have a responsibility um, here on Earth, and I will say, and if I may take another minute, Lou, I mentioned earlier at the very beginning that I was inspired to to write the Space Settlement Act. I will say that it was only a, about a month or two before I came to that realization that I read, I first read Frank White's book in 1987. Yeah. So um, I I do attribute my frame of mind uh, in, in, in coming up with that to uh, to Frank's uh, Frank's inspiration. There, there you go, Frank. Thank you, Steve. I'm, I'm going to jump right in now. Go ahead, Tamara. I've had my hand up forever, and I'm going to jump in. <laughs> to this this is Tamara? Yes. Hi, I'm Tamara. Frank, I'm so happy that you're here. Thank you for making it. Um, I think we here all consider you kind of the uh, elder states person here. And so welcome. I want to say that. Yeah. Um, I want to just the first guru, I think. No. <laughs> first guru. Okay. <laughs> I, I want to, um, I, I can put my hand down now. I, I want to just kind of ask this question because we've been talking about um, the necessity of branching out into space. And Frank, I really have appreciated the, the framing of, of uh, that you put forward in your paper of Earth as being part of a, of, of a wider community of planets where we can inhabit. Um, but of course, I'm gonna have a different perspective, I think, um, because, because the experience that I grew up with and the experience that I live on a regular basis is maybe different, right? So my... Um, understanding of, say for instance, of what it might be to have an overview exp uh, experience on the earth does not come out of my backyard, right? I live in an urban environment, uh, inner city urban environment that is by design of our, of our government, um, deliberately made to be not the most inspiring space to live in. Um, and I live there, right? I, I chose to live here on purpose because I do community work. And so I think about these things, about how do we make sure we engage and have a space environment that is welcoming to the entire planet and that we don't repeat some of the um, habits of exclusion that we have had historically and that we don't, treat, um, we don't treat the expansion of space as something that we either make exclusionary for the special people or exclusionary for the not so special people, right? And, and I'm pulling this back into the topic of, of meditation because it has been my experience in doing community, community work that these topics are hard and having a center that you can pull into um, to be able to deal with them honestly is fairly important. It's actually hard to not uh, react negatively when you're challenged. So I just wanna put that out there to the group how do we feel about this idea of, of, of expanding that is inclusive? So. You want to start with him? Well, go ahead, Bo. Go ahead. Go ahead, Frank. I'm glad you brought up that question because the human space program, which is uh, 
the organization I co-founded that is really uh, putting a lot of energy behind this. We're saying we want a sustainable, ethical, and inclusive evolution of humanity into the solar ecosystem. So I feel really strongly that what we're talking about is avoiding the mistakes of the past, uh, really writing a new chapter in human history, and learning from all the mistakes we've made, which you have cited. Space for all. I mean, it's not for the elite. It's not for uh, the wealthy. It's for everybody. It's for everybody in humanity. And one of the things that concerns me now is that we're on the cusp of breaking out into the solar system. And we can do it with attitudes that are old and tired and worn out, or we can do it with new attitudes like the ones you're talking about. So I, I'm totally committed to that. And I believe it has a lot to do with arousing interest on the part of people who don't know what's happening and are not included in the conversation. So I think a lot of it is getting more people into the discussion. Juan, um, I, can't, I can't love what Frank was saying go um, without going to you to talk about the work you do in mentorship, because I, I believe that question touches on this, doesn't it? Well, I think it's the notion, at least the mentorship part. I'm not sure it answers the direct question because I understood uh, Tamara's question and, and it is, uh, here's the question, we're gonna bring our present problems forward or we're gonna have new problems, but at least somehow the present problems we can move forward on. Uh, that's my hope. I, I think we can. I think general history shows that we do that. On the other hand, humans have a tendency sometimes to do things that aren't necessarily um, even in our own best interests, uh, mm -hmm. collective. However, you know, I do think when you're out in space and you're all together, you, it's, it's gonna be a different dynamic. And that's actually the, the, the good news. My, my, my dad, I, actually I can tell you, so, no, I don't wanna do that. Anyway, I made my point, but Tamara, I get it. <laughs> um, Tamara and I, by the way, Tamara, I know the real truth is, and that if all of humanity was born in Brooklyn, everything would be better. There you go. I knew that was coming when you get right. to those two Brooklyn and folks. I know that real truth. And I've arrived at through meditation. She arrived at it because she was born there. But anyway, so was I. <laughs> anyway. All right. Anyway, moving on to your point. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, quickly, Lon, because we're going to, we have to wrap it up. Okay, here. Okay, I'm uh, sorry. Look, as far as me uh, mentorship goes, uh, it's, it's, it's part of the seeing myself as, as, again, that cog in the continuum because I'm at the point now where I'm trying to, as much as I can, it's almost one of my, it's, it's, it's my goal, it's my passion right now, is to pass on as much as I've learned to others. Um, and I, I take, I spend a lot of time, I've always been, I try to be a mentor, but now I spend more and more time very purposefully. And I think that's part of it. So um, that's the answer to that question. Okay, and that's gonna have to be the, uh, the last point made here. Um, Lon Levin, Steve Wolf, Frank White, especially, uh, thanks for being a part of this today. Uh, we really we appreciate this. And Lon, we finally got it done. We'll probably do more of these. Good. Um, I also want to thank, also want to thank uh, Jason Rainbow and Deborah Werner for starting us off. My colleague, Joe Fargnoli, without whom this doesn't happen, our supporters, and of course, the team at SSPI, Tamara Bond-Williams, who you heard from, Matthew Owen, who's been running the show here, and our intern, David McIntosh. So thank you, everyone, for that. Um, next month, we'll be doing something interesting as well, because it is the summer, and we'll be talking about multiverses and other geeky stuff and the business of same uh, and how it relates to space. So um, you'll be interested in what we come up with there as well, I think. Um, so thank you for that. And then finally, uh, just a couple of future events, then we'll let you go. Um, we mentioned that uh, August 17th, we've got our next round table. After that, uh, the SSPI WISE organization will be meeting. 
and um, that's going to be July 28th at 2 o'clock Eastern. And Julie Kramer, uh, the transition coach, will uh, be with us for the topic of elevating women, uh, of elevating women, uh, the art of negotiation. And we thank Hughes for their support there. So that's SSPI Wise Women in Space Engagement. And if you are a woman in this industry, um, it is our fastest growing chapter, actually. And it's uh, really something that we think uh, we hear has been useful. So we hope you'll show up um, for that on the 28th. And then uh, finally, Space Business Qualified Online Training. We talked earlier about the problems we're having hiring. Well, one of the things that um, companies are doing is giving them uh, access to the SBQ course, Space Business Qualified, so that you can uh, allow your employees to learn the business of space. There's no course like it. It was designed by the Global VSAT Forum, SATPROF, and SSPI. You can learn more about it at the website, and you can actually take a free course. And human resources officers are telling us that that is a, a very strong retention tool. And we also have our Better Satellite World podcast every Monday. You can listen to conversations just like this. We have spoken with Frank. We've spoken with Lon. I think we've spoken with Steve in the past. And we always try to have good conversations about our industry, uh, where we are and where we're going. So again, thank you, everybody. And on behalf of SSPI, the New York Space Alliance, and every professional in this industry, let's go out and make it a better satellite world. Enjoy the rest of your summer. We'll see you in August. Thank you all. Bye, everybody. Thank you all. And the meeting will be ending in five seconds. So just so that's not super abrupt. So thanks, guys. Sorry we ran a little long.